as your body and remember the sacrifice that you made and that you gave on our behalf. We ask that you help us to use this time to reflect on the significance of what you've done for us, that you became like us to do for us what we couldn't do for ourselves, and all of that in order to show us how and to share your love with us. We ask that you bless this bread, and it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Continuing on, verse 25, in the same way, after supper, he also took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant established by my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the suffering that you endured um, so that our sins, our shortcomings, our failures can be and are forgiven. May our lives reflect the love that you demonstrated for us. And may this group of believers continue the work you started and follow in your footsteps. We ask that you bless this moment and bless this cup that we share as we remember the life that you gave and the grace and the eternal life that we all have gained because of it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory. At this time, we ask that everybody would stand. We're going to have this opportunity to dismiss all of our children ages 3 through 3rd grade to go through these doors over here for some time with crew worship. And now we're going to have Jeff sing Shout Hallelujah.
Boy, I'm so glad that you are here today, whether you're joining us here on campus, which just continues to grow in number, and we're grateful for that, or whether you're part of our online uh, worship, we're glad that you are here. We are in a series called, Does Church Really Matter? And part of what we're doing with this series, and a major reason that I and the staff and the elders, we're all working together on this, is because... After what we've come through with COVID, we believe we need to recapture and revision what it means to be church. So we're going to try to be communicating lots of things to you over the next several weeks as our elders have been in prayer and discernment. And you may not be aware of this, but from the very beginning of the quarantine, for over a year now, our shepherds have met weekly to be in prayer and to be seeking God and to be discussing and discerning where the church needs to go and how to be responsive in all the many different ways. And so we feel now that we're into a season where we're beginning to emerge. We're not saying that we're completely out of COVID. We're not saying that it's all over. But we are saying that God has opened up some places for us to now move and vision and dream again. That's what Elder's been doing. So we're going to try to be communicating lots of information to you about what that's going to look like over the next several weeks. There's not going to be a single announcement. There's going to be announcements. There's going to be information. So one of the things that I'm going to ask from you is if you are not yet tied into our email and subscribed to our YouTube channel, I want to ask you to do both of those things. Because we're going to be using all of our different vehicles to communicate to you and as well as time during the service. So make sure you're subscribed to receive our emails and also make sure that you're subscribed on the YouTube channel. And you'll see a little bell on that. If you'll ring the bell, as they say, that'll give you notifications because we're going to communicate lots through our video presence as, as well. One of the questions that we've already received is, um, is, are we going to continue the live stream? And I want you to know that, yes, we're going to continue the live stream. In fact, uh, we just recently invested more into the live stream. Now we have the capabilities of miking the congregation as we sing and worship together. And so that's going to continue. We're going to continue to, to reach out into the world through this means, and it's not going away. We also have space available in our worship, in our gym. If you want to be on campus but yet don't feel safe being Closer than six feet, because as we fill this room up, that's going to be harder and harder to maintain. We've got a space in our gym. We'll call it the overflow space right now, but it's, we're streaming this service right in there right now. It's up on a very large screen. We're projecting it. You can experience that. We're trying to communicate lots of stuff. Last week, the elders tried um, by having a meeting, and thank you for all those that came to that meeting. We're going to talk some more about that in just a second. But let me give you a couple of things that are starting again today or that may be starting just now that you're not yet aware of, and some of our Sunday morning opportunities is, once again, things are going to be changing quickly again around here. But we now have several Sunday morning opportunities outside of just our worship time together. Some of those come at 9 o'clock already. Some of these have been going on, but we have, for adults, we have a legacy class that's been meeting out in the left portable. We have a a class that just now launched um, a week ago called Share Your Faith. And that's at 9 a.m. also, and that's in the conference room. And you may want to be a part of that. They're learning practical strategies on how to share your faith. It's part of our vision going forward is that we're going to be a share our story, share the good news, share our faith kind of church. And you want to, want to get in on the ground floor of that, you can be a part of that. Also, at the, the second hour now, which will now follow the service, we have two new, possi- two new opportunities showing up today. One's going to be our Young Families class is, is coming again. If you've been a part of that before or you hadn't been a part of that yet, it meets out in the right portable. And I want you to be a part of that. These two classes are both going to be studying what we talk about in the sermon. They're going to be carrying that message forward. And so another one is also going to be launching in what we call our video venue room, which is right down here where you dropped off your kids for, uh, while they have the crew worship during this time. Uh, for our students, we have this going on. I'm sorry, for our children, we'll do that. We have, following this, we're going to have um, all the, the child care up 
up through fourth, fifth, sixth grade. We're going to have all that's available, classes available for them. If you put your student or your child into the crew worship already, they'll handle the transition for you. They'll take those right into our children's ministry second hour opportunities. And so if you want to stay around to be participating in one of the classes, one of the, the group opportunities, you're more than welcome to do that. As well as our student ministry is active. They've been one of the most active groups during all this past year. And there's some incredible things going on there. One of them that you need to know about today is called Cross Train. And that's our high school group. It alternates high school and middle school. So today is a high school day. We'll dismiss right at the end of the sermon for them to go be with uh, Justin and Rose Hammond, our uh, youth ministers. And you can go be a part of that. And they are doing a very significant deep dive into uh, what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And some powerful stuff going on, uh, going on there. So... It's going to be a lot of information, I know. I'm going to bring Jake up, because one of the things we're going to do is we're going to let you hear from the elders each week, and they're going to be working hard to communicate with you. So Jake's going to come up and share some things that have been going on during COVID that we're grateful for and ways that that points to the future. Jake? Uh, the operative word there in Scott's announcement is last week, we tried to communicate effectively. We didn't quite land it, and for that, I apologize. Uh, I do appreciate everybody that stayed for second hour and that watched online and for all your comments and feedback. And again, we appreciate that more than we can say. But we didn't get accomplished what we had set forth in, uh, in our hearts. Uh, part of that was the fact that we had too much on the agenda, not enough time, and not enough structure to it. So that's bad on our part. Uh, so we're coming back around and we're going to try and disseminate that in a little different way little different manner and uh, and try to do a better job of that. Uh, I do have to say we discovered that after uh, looking at getting together and talking about it on Monday night and all just pretty much decided okay that didn't work as well as we had thought or as we had pictured in our minds and we came away from the meeting going forward with a new plan. I still wasn't really ready to give up and go wow did we miss it that bad because I know I'm a great communicator. I mean, I did, again, well, clearly y'all agree. Uh, so I thought, well, let me check this out. So Wednesday night in home group, we're sitting there in Slotsky's with our group talking, and Mary and Truett's across the table from me. I can always count on Mary and being direct and uh, not sugarcoating anything with me. So I just asked him how he thought Sunday went. He said, I went okay. And that was about all. And I said, well, I said, I just really can't understand how we missed it so bad. I said, I know I'm a great communicator. I said, look at, look at the 35 years Brendan and I have been married. I have never miscommunicated with her. We've always communicated with perfect clarity, never had a misunderstanding. He couldn't look at me straight in the eye after I'd said that. My wife, after she finished laughing, her words were, who are you married to? <laughs> so anyway, again, I, uh, I guess perception and reality on my part are just a little bit out of uh, congruency. So... Uh, we, will, uh, we will back up and, and try to do better. So this morning, my message is to uh, celebrate the generosity of this congregation. And we did mention this last Sunday. Uh, but uh, COVID has revealed a lot of things over the last year and in 2020. One thing it did not reveal, it did not reveal the generosity of this congregation. This congregation has always been generous, generous to a fault, Generosity is in our DNA, and for the 30 plus years that I've been here, it's never, never been any different. So don't get me wrong, COVID isn't one of those things that, oh wow, look at what we can do. Uh, you've always been generous. And last year we saw that in your faithfulness and contributing to the work of this body. We appreciate that very much. Uh, I find myself relating more and more to the Apostle Thomas in that if I can't see it, I tend to doubt. And when we were up here during COVID, and it was just the six of us and Marsha and, and Paxton, and we're looking at an empty room, and I'm kind of going, okay, what's happened now? It did. It, it shook me to the core going, okay, what happens? You know, how do we continue to function as a body? Y'all didn't have that problem. You just kept right on going, and uh, we trudged through it. And again, I appreciate that more than, more than I can say. The other thing is, on top of that, we started the Good Neighbor Fund, and you contributed over and above to that, 19,000 plus into that fund, which was used to help others that had been 
hurt by this pandemic or was struggling or needed, uh, needed assistance. So once again, everybody stepped up and contributed you know, above and beyond uh, our expectations. Another way that you contributed and you supported was the Christmas table. And we'd been doing that now, what, three years? Third year of doing that. Uh, handed out over 300 boxes during COVID, during a time when you know, rates were high and it wasn't quite comfortable coming out. You participated not only with financial resources providing the boxes, but also with your time. You came out and participated in putting those together, handing those out, giving people an experience while they were waiting to do that. And again, I appreciate that uh, more, than, more than I can say. Uh, now, because of all that, because of your generosity, uh, it is exciting looking forward to what we can do in the future uh, with that. And again, I uh, just want to thank you for that. And uh, I know that that is in everybody's hearts and that the Spirit has placed that there and uh, will continue to do so. At this time, would you please join me in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for, again, the many blessings that you give us, and we are thankful of your generosity, and especially of allowing your Son to die on the cross for our sins, for his grace, which so generously covers our sins, to make us pure and holy in your sight. And we pray as we focus forward on what this church can do, and what we can do with the generosity of this body, in blessing the community around us, in blessing those that you put in our path and bring to us. We pray that we will always be mindful of those opportunities and put our efforts into helping others and extending your grace and generosity to others and living out each and every day, loving our neighbor as we should love ourselves. Again, we thank you for the many blessings you give us. May we always strive to do your will and to live our lives to your honor and glory each and every day. It is in your son's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Jake. Appreciate the shepherds. And once a week or once during our service each week, you're going to be hearing a word from them as, as we begin to dream and envision what the future uh, for us. That's why we're wrestling with this question. Does church really matter? Because it's changed so much, hasn't it? And we started last week by asking this question, can we just get back to normal? Can, can we just get back to the way that things were? And w the conclusion that we came to last week was because of the resurrection, there is no going back to normal. When Jesus walked out of the tomb, all that we thought was normal, all that we thought the way the world worked, the way that that everything flowed. It flowed from birth to death, and that was just the end of it. Jesus upended that completely. And so there is no going back to normal. The resurrection of Jesus means there is no getting back to normal. And so Jesus launches the church, this thing. He, he launches this effort together. And we've got to then ask the question, okay, but in today's world, in, in, in the 2021 world, does it still matter? Does it play a role in the church or not? And we're going to try to look at a biblical vision of what it means to be church. We're going to reclaim here, go back to the very beginning of it and see what the original idea was behind it. And so I want to do a little experiment with you just right now. When you think of, when you think of church, what is your word picture? What, what's the word picture when you hear the word church that comes to mind? Because the word picture that we have is very important because it defines so much about how we respond to this. And for many of us, we have the picture of a what? A building, don't we? That's the first thing that comes to mind when you say church, you think structures, you think building. You know, I grew up thinking that the church was, you know, God's house. That's where he lived. And so we would show up once a week and we'd visit him. And apparently he was kind of grouchy because we'd sing a song that said, tiptoe, tiptoe in God's house. Anybody else live through that one besides just me? Like God was the old man standing on his front yard yelling at the kids, get off my lawn. So that was an image, though. 
So what's your image of church? Because how we have that image. So you may see the church as a social club. You may feel on the outside of that social club, and as you look back into it, you go, well, they seem like some nice people, but I don't belong there. Maybe you see the church as a hospital. And there's a hospital for, for sinners and people that need help. Maybe you see it as, as an army to move forward and change social justice in the world. Maybe you see it as a family. And there can be positive and negative ones. But see, the word picture is important, isn't it? Because here, here's the difference in a word picture. If I were to say, we're going to go on a cruise, that's going to conjure up one thing. Or, or a certain image, isn't it? You know, cruise ships, as they start to come back now, you know, you think of, of rest and relaxation and entertainment. But if I say the cruise is not on a cruise ship, the cruise is on a battleship, that changes it, doesn't it? That, that changes what your expectation is. You know, on a cruise ship, they're going to come on the speaker at some point. I've never been on a cruise, but I hear stories. would like to go on one. If anybody's ever going on one, you want to take somebody else, I'm available. But on a cruise ship, they'll come over the PA and said, Today's entertainment choices include this. And you can go on the promenade deck and do this. And we'll have these later. And this, these restaurants are going to be open. And today, when we get to shore, you're going to be able to do, take these excursions. Just let us know. They don't make that announcement at 6.30 in the morning, do they? They don't wake you up in your room. They just make it more like 10 o'clock. But on a battleship, it's different, right? Nobody comes on a battleship and says, when you'd like to report to battle stations, just let us know. We hope you enjoy the meal today provided. Nope. Somewhere early in the morning, on whichever watch it is, the alarm goes off, report, we've got a mission to accomplish. But you see, the image is completely different. Both are ships. Both are cruising. But the which one, every one you see, changes what you're thinking about. This is why we need to capture a biblical vision of what it means to be church. And I want us to go into this idea today, and we're going to take the metaphor, the image that is the predominant image in your New Testament for what it means to be church. Because we're going to spend some time in one place over the next several weeks. And we're going to comb through this scripture. We're going to comb through the, this scripture three different times, okay? And there's a reason we're going to go this place because I think the image is so powerful and the teaching in this part of scripture is so powerful and it ties right into what God calls us to be a church. You've seen this triangle up here. We've had it many times. You can even see it on our coffee cups because this is so important to us. We believe that we are called as a church to lead people into a life-giving relationship with Jesus Christ. That the, the abundant life, John 10.10 10 says from Jesus' own words, I have come so that you may have life and have it to the full or have it abundantly in the different ways that the translations handle it. This abundant life we believe are found in the truth of having life in Christ. That it is inside Jesus in our life as we follow him and trust him with our salvation that life becomes and suddenly makes sense once again. And then it's with one another, this interaction between each other, that as we be, be this community, put the word church in here, this church that does life together following the leading of this one that died for us. And then we live as people on a mission. People with hope and purpose to our lives. Well, we're going to spend... Three weeks at least today and at least two more in one passage of Scripture that for many of you is going to be very familiar. And we're going to spend it there because as I was preparing, as I was studying, I was praying over this, it suddenly occurred to me that all three of these components are found in this one passage. And you may not have looked at it this way before, but we're going to look at it this way and we're going to dive in because, because what they're going to do is they're going to give us a new image of what it means to be in church. So I want you to grab your Bibles, open your apps, get on your phones, whatever, to 1 Corinthians. 
1 Corinthians is a book in your New Testament. And find chapter 12. And if you've got something to write with, I want to encourage you to have that out. Or if you've got a, a software on your, your device where you can highlight stuff, I want you to do, do that. Because we're going to work our way through this again. If you want to know what the sermon's going to be about next week, read this passage again this week. Because we're going to be back here. I want you to hear this because they're about to give us a different metaphor. Not a family, not an army, not a building, not a hospital, but a very particular metaphor. And this is the ultimate metaphor for the church inside your New Testament. Here's what it says. Verse 12. And I'm going to read the whole thing. It's lengthy, but I just want you to hear it all at once and then we'll pick it apart. Verse 12, just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. The head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it. So that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now, we typically have a different metaphor for church, don't we? We typically have... A family metaphor. Now, family is a good metaphor. I'm not knocking if you thought of church as a family. In fact, you may have grown up referring to your fellow Christians as brothers and sisters in Christ. So that's a strong one. But I'm going to at least make a case today that a body is a far more powerful metaphor for what the church is supposed to be and gives us far more direction. Because here's the simple truth. You, in some ways, you don't get to choose who you're born to, but as you come into young adulthood and adulthood, you get to kind of choose your family, don't you? You, you get to be selective there. You can decide whether you're going to stay with your family. You, you decide whether you're going to stay with your spouse. That, that becomes decisions that you get to make. And people can be called family and not have spoken to each other for decades, Right? I mean, that's some of your story. So some of you have family members, and there's been some break somewhere, and you're still family. But that doesn't mean that we're showing up and talking to each other at Christmas, right? It means something completely different. It means that there's this wound there that just will not go away. And so when somebody like me gets up and says, hey, let's talk about family and how we're one great family, you're like, that's not a good image for me. But body's different. You know, listen to the power in that. You, know, you don't vote off parts of your body, do you? My left hand has never been so angry at my right hand that said, I'm done with you. I'm out of here. It, it's this connected idea that is 
permanent and lasting. And I want you to know that the idea is most often in the New Testament used towards the idea of being connected to a local church, to a local body. Yes, the, the idea of Jesus' body universal, global, around the world, yes, yes, yes. But most often it is used in the context of talking, being related to and connected into the local church. I don't try to do a lot of Greek words with you, but let me show you one Greek word. It's this. It's a little hard to see up there, but it's milos. The idea is that you are, you are milos. This is anytime you're, you're in that part, in the last thing where it says the parts of the body. Um, other translations, King James Version, several others, they use the members of the body. Now we have that word member in our ideas, this membership. It's this word, it's milos. Okay, You are milos. Okay? Now look, you've learned something today already. That's worth your time to show up and log in, okay? You're Milos. Why is that important? Because this word means member, but it means very specifically a member of a body, like a body part. So when Paul is using this illustration, this idea of becoming a body, he is talking about being a part of a body, like the physical body. There are other words that can be like member of a group. In fact, if you notice the Time when he says he was a member of the Sanhedrin, a member of the council. That's not this word in your New Testament. This word refers to a body part, a digit, a limb, an extension, an organ. You are a part of the body. You are Milos. And so, so this body, now we get the idea of the church doesn't act like a family in its worst case scenario but acts more like a body and so now that means we're connected in a whole different way and i've got to be i've got to be close enough to you to be connected to you that when you celebrate i celebrate and when you grieve i grieve and when you hurt i hurt and i don't get to ignore you I shared before, if you know me well enough, cross my thumb. I've got about a two, three inch scar that I've had since elementary. It's because I used to walk to school. Now, I know it's hard to believe that we let kids used to do that, actually walk to school. But I mean, we're talking like over a mile, you know, you know to school. And mom just apparently was reckless and sent us out in the world and, you know, walked to school. So we walked through a construction site where they always had their glass Coke bottles. And so on the way, we thought it was really cool to pick up these glass Coke bottles each day and go smash them against rocks because that's just cool when you're in fifth grade. And so I do this one day, and me and my buddies, were walking, we grabbed some Coke bottles, and I smashed one, and one of them didn't smash all the way because, and I didn't want to leave a job half finished. So so I picked up the Coke bottle, and it had been kind of broken right along, sort of just like an angle across it. And I grabbed it again and wasn't thinking. And when I threw it, I, I was holding on to the cut edge. And so when I did that, apparently what happened, it just filleted my thumb open. But I didn't know about it at first. So I go walking another hundred yards, head to school. You know, we're like, hey, we smashed our Coke bottles. We're good. You know, check. You know, I can move on to the rest of my day now. And I get 100 yards and I look down and there is blood all over my clothes. And so I do one of these. What is going on? And finally, I look and down my hand, I mean, I'm just bleeding. And it is dripping everywhere. Well, at that moment... My left thumb didn't go, ha ha. <laughs> I knew it. You always get to do the throwing, you know. You know, I've been so jealous. Now maybe he'll use me to throw some. You know, no, you know, I mean, suddenly the eyes go wide, the blood begins to drain out of my face, left hand jumps in, it's holding, the feet get involved, you know. 
the tears started, I mean, started flowing. No, they didn't. The eyes didn't get involved. <laughs> okay, my whole body kicked into one thought. Help the thumb. And we were running off to the school nurse as fast as we could. That's the description that we have. We're connected in such a way. You and me. Us together. We form not a group, not a club, but we form a body. And so I'm asking you to really consider how tied into the body are you. Because Paul uses this idea of this body and what it means. Again, it's megalos. It's you're a part of this body. And one of the truths about that is if you cut off a part of the body, it doesn't thrive, it dies. If you separate body parts, they wither and go away. They're no longer functional. Take any limb, whatever, if it's removed from the body, the arm is no longer capable of functioning on its own. The eye no longer functions on its own. Whatever part of the body you want to talk about, separated from the body, takes on a whole new reality, doesn't it? I, I mean, you even know this. Se- separating from the body is just kind of gross. If you, you, you can see a beautiful woman with beautiful nails, but I don't want one of her nails in my soup, right? Because it's separated from the body. So here's a truth that I want to share with you today. You're not a body part if you're not part of the body. You're not a body part if you're not part of the body. Or maybe you'll like this way. I thought this may be a better way to say it. You ain't nobody if you ain't a part of nobody. How about that? Does that translate better? That's what Paul's telling us. There's no such thing as being a follower of Jesus outside of the body of Jesus. There's no such thing as being a part of Christ outside of the body of Christ. One guy put it this way. That's like saying I'm a football player, but I don't have a football team. Well, you're a fan at that point. And so we've got to understand that the image that the New Testament is giving us is that we need each other and you need to be connected into the body because that's who you were created to be. And so what I love about this passage is he deals with two particular lies. If you want to look back just really quickly, when he talks about the part in verse, um, go to verse 15. Now if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand... I do not belong to the body. It would not, for that reason, stop being a body part. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being being a part of the body. Then if you jump to 23, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, and the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. Paul is directly addressing two of the biggest lies that is still being shared about the church today. And here's lie number one. I don't need you. I don't need you. I hear this consistently from people when they want to put up a defense about not being part of a church. That, that I, I don't need you. I, I, I don't need that in my life. Now, I'll be the first to say... There are some unhealthy churches out there, and if you've experienced one of them, I'm not saying you need that. But I am saying the idea that I don't need anybody else, I'm just going to follow Jesus on my own, I'm good to go. You need to understand, that's not how God designed it, therefore that's not how it works. You need to be around other believers, connected to other believers in Jesus. There is a power in that. Think of any group that tries to help you change, that tries to help you develop new habits or a new way of life. So many of them will capitalize onto this idea of being in a community of people. Whether you take Alcoholics Anonymous 
or Weight Watchers or any of the other groups that are trying to help you have positive change in your life, they will always rely on the power, because you are wired this way by God, rely on the power of coming together in groups and getting support from one another. That, that, this is why being here together is critical. Let me show you another passage, one of my favorite, I think it's powerful. This is in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10 Verse 23, and, and we're about to read a verse that you've heard before, I bet. Because this is a verse that a lot of preachers like because it tells you you need to be a part of a church. But I'm going to tell you why this verse is in here. And here's what it says, 10 to 23. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for the promise is faithful. Now, I've got that word highlighted because we're going to come back to it. That's the key word of this verse. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together. This is the verse that preachers like so much. As some are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Now, it's nice to quote that verse and say, well, see, you should just be a part of the church. Don't give up meeting together. But the point is, why are they saying that? And it says, let us hold on unswervingly. Okay? You know what it means to swerve, to go back and forth recklessly? Okay, this word becomes really important to you when your kids go from 15 to 16 because they start driving. Okay, that's right where my twins are right now. And so when we get into the car, and now it's not me in the driver's seat, it's not Eric in the driver's seat, it's Cutter or it's Cooper in the driving seat, unswervingly becomes really important to us. Not just that they're unswervingly, but that everybody else out on I-35 is going unswervingly. I have had cars go past us before. And you may have had this experience too where they are all over the road and you have no idea, are they drunk? Are they texting? What are they doing? And have actually called in some cards because it is just dangerous out there. We recognize the danger of swerving when it comes to driving and what Paul and what the writer of Hebrews is trying to get us to do is recognize the danger of swerving when it comes to your life. And you need people in your life where they can come around you and they love you and are connected to you enough because, once again, we're a part of a body together where they can speak into your life and they're willing to have a difficult conversation that says, you are swerving right now. You are playing around in an area you don't need to be playing around in right now. You are approaching an affair. You are approaching an addiction. You are approaching ruining your family. You are making money an idol, whatever it is, you need some people in your life that will love you enough to have that hard conversation because they see you swerving and out of love for you, they will come and confront you with the truth that you don't even want to recognize. So the lie, I don't need you, is not one that you can put up anymore. Here's the second lie. You don't need me. Now this one, I've got to do a confession and an apology. Because so often, the church or churches have put out this idea that we don't need you anymore. That you don't fit here anymore. You don't belong to us anymore. And the church will do its own amputation though it never should. And if that describes your story, I just want to say I'm sorry. If, if, if you've ever experienced that from this church, I'm sorry. Because if, if you've been hurt by a church that somehow sent you the message that you are no longer a part, you don't fit, you don't belong, your politics aren't right, whatever it is, Have you ever noticed that people change churches because of politics but never change politics because of church? That's freebie. It's not in my notes. But if you've ever received that, that that message, then 
what you need to know is that you were a part of a church that forgot what it meant to be body together. Because the body doesn't look at other body parts and says, you don't fit here. You don't belong here. We, this church, need you. All through this passage, and we'll talk more about this in the coming weeks, it talks about the giftedness of each person. You are gifted by God, and you are a gift to this church, or to whatever church you're a part of, by God. And we don't get to ignore that. There is something that God is doing in your life and through you and with you that you bring with you into this that make us better, that make us more, more, and more like the body of Christ. And it may be revealed in your passions and your prayer life. Or maybe it's a gift that that you share, you know, I, I do not have, nobody argues with me that I do not have the gift of leading worship and singing. It's a fact. I've learned to accept it. But that doesn't mean I'm not part of the body, but what I, what I need, I need those that have that gift to experience worship in a powerful way. So I need you. And we need each other in this to come and be a part of this body. Because ultimately, it's not about you, and it's not about me. It's about Christ. We are Christ's body. The one that laid down his own body so that we could be a part of it. The one that allowed his body to be beaten and broken as we celebrate in the supper earlier. So that we could be in fellowship, not just with him, but with each other in a whole new way. And not only was his body beaten and broken, but it was dead and laid in the tomb. And yet through the power of the resurrection, he lived again and lives now. And that is his vision for his church. The church that he said he was going to build. So, I've got a real practical question for you right now. Are you connected? Are you a part of the body? Now, I, I would love for it to be this body, but maybe you're watching this online, and maybe you're not anywhere local. I, I would never want the live stream, if you're spread out around the country, to substitute for your engagement in a local body of Christ. I I think that would miss the point. Even though I'm so grateful you're a part of this, don't let it be a substitute. But for those that are here in this area that are a part of this, this, are you connected? Are, Are you a part of this body? Or perhaps you've bought into lie number one or lie number two, and it's time to get past that. As we emerge out of COVID, I need your help. As, as we are revisioning the future and reclaiming this biblical vision, we need your help. I'm going to ask you to do something right now. If you've got your cell phone, take your cell phone out. And this is whether you're watching this online or you're here in the room or you're in an overflow room. I want you to pull up your text messaging app. Because... We're still, in this, our shepherds are coming together and the staff, and we're working hard. We're, we're still trying to figure out exactly where we are as we emerge out of this. And we don't want to miss anybody. And so I'm going to ask you to help us out. If you see yourself as a part of this body, or you're wanting to be a part of this body, I want you to send me a text message right now. Here's the number that I want you to text to. And I just want you to put your name, just say, I'm in. Now, if you're like, I want to be a part, but I'm I'm not sure I feel feel that yet, then just say, I'd like to be a part, but I don't feel it yet. That's okay. We, We just need to figure out how are we coming back together again as we start dreaming together about the future and connecting to one another again. 
And there was some great stuff that happened over quarantine. I'm not knocking any of those efforts, but God is calling us to something now. And if we're really going to wrestle with this question, does church matter? It's going to take each of us saying, I'm in and I'm connected and I realize it's not easy. And I realize you may have been hurt in the past. And I realize you may never thought of a reason for it. And you may have all kinds of lists of concerns and questions and stuff that I haven't even talked about today. I get it. But we've got to start somewhere. And I want us to go back into what Paul's saying. It says, you are the body of Christ. And together we come. So if you would, send us that text. Let us know. And we're grateful. I want to pray for us. Father, I pray for each person here as we realize that we are by lifeblood part of the body. That we cannot be separated as followers of you. That we must be tied in. We must be connected. And Father, I pray for anyone that doesn't yet sense that they're connected or hasn't made that commitment to be connected. That whether it's this church, this local body, or some other father, that they would be connected in. They would be reached and say, I want to be a part. Father, as we try to live out this call, this image to be the body of Christ in this area, in this place, to represent him to this part of the world. Um, First of all, I'm grateful that you would even give us the opportunity. And Father, I pray that you would show us the grace on times we messed that up. But that with this image in our minds of what Paul is calling us to be, that we would be the body of Christ. Father, by your power, would you raise this body up? By resurrection power from Easter, would you, would you lead us into all these places? Father, I pray. I pray as you continue to lead us into this future. It's by your power and your grace we pray. Amen. If you would, stand with me, please. We're going to sing. We're going to worship. Jeff's going to come up and lead this. I'm going to go ahead and ask if you're part of the uh, uh, high school cross train. You can go ahead and dismiss right now and go, go be part of that. We want to be the body of Christ to each other and to the world. There's no greater call, no greater opportunity. Jeff, if you would, let's praise that. As we dismiss from here, uh, I do want to encourage you, as, as Scott said, uh, you know, those of you that are in, uh, to take advantage of whether it be the second hour opportunities or classes beforehand or small group, whatever, whatever connection you can find, we want that to happen and uh, we want you to benefit from that and, uh, and again, uh, learn what it is to be in Christ with others and uh, on mission. At this time, if you would, please join me in reciting the grace. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all forever and ever. Amen. You're dismissed.